Severe traumatic brain injury, or TBI as I'll refer to it, is essentially when the brain incurs an external force. Um, so it could be a blow to the head, and it's an external force that's brought onto the head and basically makes the brain move within the skull. A severe traumatic brain injury often results in coma. So uh, when the brain is, is, incurs an insult uh, from the force, then um, the patient is rendered unconscious for a fairly long period of time where they're not responsive to noxious stimuli even, they don't, they're not aware of their environment. And so a severe TBI is serious enough where they will be in a coma. The common causes are, especially among our teenagers and our young 20s, is our motor vehicle crashes in the civilian population. And those are the most, that's the group, risk, the group that's at risk for uh, severe TBI. Um, is, they're at high risk because of motor vehicle crashes. Whereas our older persons in the civilian population are at risk for severe TBI because of falls. They go up to repair something and they fall from the ladder, for example, and they'll hit their head. Um, so those are common causes in, and then our children, of course, our civilian children are at risk because of child abuse or shaken baby syndrome, for example. That all can make the brain move in an unnatural force within the skull. And the skull is a bony substance and the brain is soft and so it's gonna bounce back and forth between a hard object. So the common causes within the veteran population um, that are not within a, a war zone are similar to the civilian population, so falls and motor vehicle crashes. Um, but our veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, um, the common causes for them are the explosive devices, the improvised explosive devices, so blast can cause a severe traumatic brain injury, but also, of course, their motor vehicle crashes in the, in the war zone um, are also common. So the most recent numbers from the Department of Defense for our veterans who are just returning from Iraq and Afghanistan indicate that about 1% of all the TBIs that have been reported in our current war since 2000, uh, that about 1% of them are severe TBI. So about 2,600, 2,700 of our veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan have incurred a severe TBI, severe enough for them to be in a coma. And in our veteran population, our older veterans population from Vietnam War, Korean War, for example, we, we don't have those exact numbers of severe TBI. Um, where the reporting, uh, reporting for over the time has evolved, but it hasn't evolved enough yet so that we can actually pull those numbers easily and cleanly from our databases. Severe TBI is, is caused by these incidents in our lives, um, but you have two types of damage to the brain. You have the, the damage that is a direct result of the physical insult to the brain. So if you get a blow to the head, that's the physical insult itself. But then there's secondary brain damage that evolves over time. So TBI will trigger, for example, um, changes in the neurochemical processes that are natural to our brain. So TBI will actually create an inflammatory uh, response in our brain to the extent that our brain can't manage it. And um, this inflammatory response is at the molecular level, of course, at the cellular level. And then basically it can cause the brain to swell to the extent where the, the neurosurgeons need to come and remove a little bit of the scalp to help release the pressure on the brain. Because if you have swelling in the brain, the brain has no place to go. And ultimately, it will compress the brainstem, which, um, it, which basically helps us maintain our, our respiratory system, our breathing, and our basic life support systems. Secondary damage will evolve over time. It'll evolve from a few minutes after injury to years after injury. Most often, it's within a few days, weeks of the injury that the secondary damage will evolve. So one sign would be the swelling of the brain, for example. Um, another sign is high blood pressure, um, another, because the blood flow in the brain is altered now. So the insult has caused a change in the, the way the blood is flowing through the brain. Um, so for example, another thing that could evolve over time would be something called a subdural hematoma. Um, and that's when small veins are bursting and there's, so there's a collection of blood between uh, the dura mater and the arachnoid space. And this, of course, collection of blood will cause 
the brain to shift. Secondary damage that evolves over time is often life-threatening, but also will cause severe cognitive and physical impairments down the road. Severe TBI is unique in that one brain is just that, it's one brain. Everyone has a very similar knee, okay? So one knee will look like another person's knee, but my brain looks different from your brain. And so when we incur a severe TBI, we have a very unique lesion por uh, profile. This is a very heterogeneous population. Um, it's difficult to even define a sample of people to be included in my study that we would consider homogeneous because the nature of severe TBI is that everyone's brain injury is when you've seen one severe TBI, you've seen one severe TBI. The ideal rehabilitation situation would be that once their life is saved and their, their life survival is no longer in question, the ideal scenario is for them to go to an acute rehabilitation setting, um, a hospital, to be able to be evaluated at baseline. So for example, we don't necessarily know when someone with a severe TBI is going to wake up or recover from a vegetative state or a minimally conscious state. And so this, this moment of a baseline assessment is quite critical. So that way, maybe three months or six months later, if they start to evolve and it's to start to sight, show signs of consciousness, we have all these baseline measures that we can go to and say, oh, indeed they are, and this will help us develop their therapy plans. However, um, if someone doesn't have insurance in our country, in the U.S. on the civilian side, the chances of them getting admitted to acute rehabilitation are, are, have gone down incrementally every year. Um, even if they do have insurance, they may be underinsured and not have the sufficient insurance policy to get them admitted to acute rehabilitation, of course, because this costs money. Um, so those patients will often go to nursing homes. The nursing home system really isn't geared for that population unless the family's willing to have them come home and care for them. So the families take on an entirely different role suddenly. You know, here they are, their 21-year-old is in college, and now suddenly they're they're changing his diapers, they're, they're feeding him um, through a feeding tube, they're cleaning out his airway system through the trach. So suddenly they've become sort of a nurse tech. The caregiver system in our country, as well as the medical care system in our country, is not set up for severe TBI. Society needs to continue to invest in research that will develop treatments that improve function. Right now we have few to no treatment options that we can offer this population of patients. And we need those treatments to be developed to help give them function back and improve the quality of their lives. And so society needs to continue investing in research that will help us develop those treatments. And then simultaneous with that, we have to remember that as we develop treatments, we're on the cutting edge of science. And that's the way it should be, and it, that's appropriate. But then that also challenges our ability to measure the effect, because we're also then on the outer edge of the our capabilities of measuring the effect that that, of that treatment we've just developed. So we need to invest in both those research tracks simultaneously. We also need to take a serious look, in my personal opinion, at the system of care that we have. We don't have a safety net for this population, and we need one. Mm -hmm.